Hi students, this is part two of unit nine, complex noun phrases. In the previous video, we dealt with an introduction to complex noun phrases and the possible modifications surrounding the noun, which in this case we call head noun. In this video, we'll focus on those items which are placed after the head noun. When we refer to the elements placed after the head noun, we refer to post modifiers and complements. And it's important to note that although sometimes they may seem similar, these two structures are really different. Let's exemplify post modifiers first. Within the post modification, we can find phrases and clauses. By far, the most common type of post modifier is the prepositional phrase. Here we have some examples. In the first example, we can see documents as our head noun, which has been post modified by a prepositional phrase. In the second example, our head noun is the word list, which has been post modified by a prepositional phrase too. In the following example, what I want you to see is that sometimes within a prepositional phrase, we can find another complex noun phrase. Please note that in this case, our first head noun, which is woman, has been post modified by a prepositional phrase. But inside this prepositional phrase, we can find another head noun which has been pre modified by a sequence of adverb plus several adjectives. Another common phrase which can be a post modifier is the appositive noun phrase. Remember that appositive noun phrases provide descriptive information related to the head noun. They are non-essential because they are not used to identify the reference of the head noun. Sometimes they are placed in between commas, in uh, parentheses, or in between a comma and a full stop. Let's see an example. Now let's move to clauses as post modifiers. In this slide, we can see that sometimes non-finite clauses can be post modifiers. Remember that non-finite clauses are those clauses which are not marked by tense or modality. And within non-finite clauses, we can find two infinitive clauses, ing clauses, and ed clauses. In the first example, our head noun factor has been post modified by a non-finite two infinitive clause. In the following, our head noun is the word families, which has been post modified by a non finite ing clause, but also see that in this case we have a pre modifier, which is an adjective. And finally, here we have an example where our head noun proposal has been post modified by a non finite ed clause, and inside that uh, post modifier, which is an ed clause, we may find a second head noun, a second complex noun phrase, which has been post modified by a prepositional phrase. Finite clauses can be post modifiers too. The post modification done by finite clauses include relative clauses. Relative clauses are considered adjective clauses because they are attached to an antecedent in this case, the head noun, and they provide extra information or in essential information to identify the head noun. Besides, relative clauses are always placed after the head noun, after the word they are modifying. All relative clauses include three key components. Those are the head noun, the relativizer, and the gap. We're going to see them in detail right now. As we mentioned in the previous video, the head noun is the noun which has modification. Please note that in this example, our head noun earrings has been pre-modified by a noun and post-modified by a relative clause. Continuing, we can find the relativizer. The relativizer is the subordinator which is used to introduce the relative clause. Please note that in this case, the relative clause begins with the subordinator that. Well, in standard English, we can distinguish the following relativizers, 
In between them, we may find relative pronouns like which, who, whom, who's on that, relative adverbs, where, when, and why, and in some cases, the relativizer can be omitted, resulting in zero relativizer. As regards the choice of relativizer that we are going to use, we need to bear in mind the type of head noun we need to modify. For example, with human heads, we use the relativizers who or whom. This means that they can be used with animated head nouns. With inanimated head nouns, we can use which or that. They are both similar in their grammatical potential, and sometimes they can be used interchangeably. In order to use whose as a relativizer, we need to establish a possessive relationship between a human head and some other noun within the same complex noun phrase. There's an alternative for inanimated head nouns, which is the phrase of which, but this structure is mainly used for academic prose. Finally, regarding zero relativizer, we use no relativizer or zero relativizer only in restrictive relative clauses and whenever the gap is not placed in subject position. We're going to talk about the gap in the following slide. Now let's talk about the gap. The gap is the missing constituent or the element in the relative clause which corresponds in meaning to the head noun. All relative clauses have a missing element. This gap is the location of the missing constituent in the relative clause. We're going to see some examples to identify these gaps. Let's consider this example to show the gap position. Let's first identify the components of this clause. Please note that in this case we have a complex noun phrase made up of a head noun, which is earrings. In this case, this head noun has a pre-modifier, which is a noun, and it also has a post-modifier, which is a relative clause. This relative clause begins with the relativizer that, and as we know this is a relative clause, we need to find the gap position. In order to identify the gap position, we need to separate the relative clause from the major clause, as in the following. Please note that in this case, we only have the relative clause, that mama wall. Well, to find the gap, we need to remove the relativizer. So in this case, note that the intention is to remove the relativizer that in which case we have the structure mama wo. Please note that in this new clause, we already have a subject, which is mama. We already have a verb, which in this case is a transitive verb, wo. Remember that transitive verbs must be followed by an object. So what's the missing constituent in this case? In this case, the missing element is the object of the clause. Mama wore what? The diamond earrings. In this following slide, you can see the whole analysis of this complex noun phrase. Please note, we have a head noun, which is in this case earrings, pre-modified by the noun diamond, and post-modified by the relative clause that mama wore. Please check that in this case, our relativizer is the relative pronoun that, and the gap is the one of a direct object. Why? Because mama wore the diamond earrings. Well, let's analyze the other gap positions we may find within a complex noun phrase. The gap positions we may find are subject position, object position, adverbial position, or complement of a preposition. Within these four gap positions, subject and object positions are the commonest. Consider that in the following examples, we are going to analyze post-modification only. We are not focusing on pre-modification, but remember that any time we have a complex noun phrase, we can find pre-modification and post-modification. In this first example, our relative clause that's been brewing for three days is modifying our head noun, which is T. Remember that in order to find the gap position, we need to think of the relative clause alone. 
removing the relativizer. Please check that in the following case, we have removed that, which is in this case our relativizer, and what we have is a verb, uh, which is the contraction of has plus been plus brewing, and an adverb. What do we need there? What we need there is a subject. We don't have a subject for this new clause. As a result, in the following, we have has been brewing for three days. In this case, the missing element or the missing constituent is the subject. What has been brewing for three days? The tea or the cup of tea, right? So the result of this relative clause will be the tea or the cup of tea has been brewing for three days. In this case, the gap corresponds to the subject. Here we have another example of direct object gap. In this case, our head noun is the word boy, which has been modified by a relative clause. Please note that in this case, we are using the relativizer whom. So in this case, we established a relationship between a human head and another head noun in the um, complex noun phrase. Remember to think of the relative clause in isolation and remove the relativizer, as we have done here. So we erase the relativizer whom, in which case we still have a subject, no one, our verb, new, which is in this case a transitive verb. And remember that what follows transitive verbs is the object of the clause. In this case, so, the missing element is the direct object. No one knew who, the furtive boy or the boy. In the following example, we can see an adverbial gap. In this case, our head noun is the noun way. There are some head nouns which are exclusively nouns, but they convey a sense of adverbial. In this case, our head noun is the noun way, which has been post-modified by a relative clause. In this case, we are beginning our relative clause with a relativizer in which, which is the replace. So in this case, we have removed the relative clause from the context of the major clause and we remove the relativizer. What we have as a result is a subject, a person, can be brought, which is our verb, a verb phrase, and an adverb before a court. We may say that this is a complete clause. It has all the elements that a clause may have. But remember that adverbials are optional elements and they can be removed from the clause. So in this case, the missing element is still the word way, which is a noun, but which has an adverbial reference. A person can be brought before a court this way or in this way. In which case, so in this example, the gap is the one of an adverbial. This adverbial can be removed from the clause without altering the meaning of the major clause. In the last slide, we can see an example of a gap as complement of a preposition. Please note that in this case, our head noun is the word car, which has been post-modified by a relative clause. Remember that whenever we have the dependent clause within the major clause, we need to stop the bracketing or stop the dependent clause where we find the main verb of the major clause. In this case, we have removed the relative clause from the major clause, resulting in that I crushed the shop with. Remember that to identify the gap, we need to erase the relativizer. So in this case, we are removing that. As a result, we already have in this clause a subject, a verb, an object, and a preposition. And we need to complete the idea of this preposition. So in this case, we are going to introduce our head noun within the new clause to use that, that space, or to occupy the space of the missing constituent in the relative clause. I crashed the shop with the car. Please note how our head noun, the car, now is used as the complement of the preposition in the relative clause. Now let's talk about the restrictive and non-restrictive functions of relative clauses.
Modification by relative clauses can be restrictive or non-restrictive. We are going to find a restrictive function whenever the relative clause helps us identify the reference of the head noun. In this sense, our head noun is part or its member of a class which can be identified only by the use of restrictive modification. In the following example, the astronaut who first stepped on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Our relative clause begins from the subordinator who, which is in this case a relativizer, up to the word moon because what follows is the main verb of the major clause. In this case, this relative clause serves a restrictive function because we are talking about a specific astronaut. In this case, our relative clause helps us identify which astronaut we are talking about. In this case, Neil Armstrong was not any astronaut who stepped in the moon. He was the first one. Alternatively, when we do not need to identify the head noun because it was already identified or because it's unique or independently identified within the clause, in this case we have a non-restrictive function. Non-restrictive relative clauses are not essential information and they are not needed to identify the head noun. Let's illustrate this. In the following example, Oliver Twist, which was Dickens' second novel, is a classic. This non-restrictive relative clause begins with the subordinator which and consider that in this case this clause is placed in between commas. This is so-called a positive clause too. Consider too that in this case we don't need to identify the noun because we are talking about a specific novel written by Charles Dickens. So in this case it's not necessary for us to identify the head noun because it's unique. Now let's move to complementation. At the beginning we said that the elements which can be placed after the head noun may be post modifiers or complements and that they are different structures. Well noun complements may seem identical sometimes to relative clauses but they are not the same. In the following chart we can see some distinctions between them. The function of a relative clause is the one to identify the reference of a head noun, while a complement clause presents only the content of the head noun and it serves as descriptive information. So whenever we talk about a complement clause, we need to see that this clause gives us information related to the content of the previous controlling element, which is our head noun. Regarding the structure, relative clauses contain a gap. Remember, the gap is a missing constituent that can be filled with the head noun in the relative clause, right? Noun complement clauses, on the other hand, have no gap. This means the noun complement clause has all the elements a clause must have. In relative clauses, the subordinator is called relativizer and they contain relative pronouns, relative adverbs, or zero relativizer. And in non complement clauses, the relativizer is called complementizer. In relative clauses, the relativizer can be omitted if the gap is not placed in subject position. While in non complement clauses, it's impossible to remove the complementizer. Finally, relative clauses can modify almost any noun, while noun complement clauses are used with fewer nouns. We're going to see some examples of this later. Now let's illustrate this distinction between relative clauses and noun complement clauses. The first one is a relative clause and the second is a noun complement clause. Let's see how they are different from each other. At first sight, we can say that this is a non-restrictive relative clause, or we may also call it an appositive clause because it's placed in between commas. Now let's see that in this case, it's not necessary for us to identify the head noun because we are talking about a specific kind of book, which is the Bible. It's not any kind of book that we need to identify. We have already identified the type of book we are talking about. Our relative clause begins with the relativizer which, 
And please note that in this case, if we remove this relativizer, we already have a verb. What do we need in this case? A subject. So please note that in this case, we can use our head noun Bible to be, in this case, the subject of this clause. What has been retranslated? The Bible, right? So in this case, the gap position is the one of the subject. The Bible has been retranslated. Now let's move to the noun complement clause. In this case, our head noun is the noun hope. And what we have in the that clause is the content of the hope. So this complement clause gives us information related to the content of our head noun. In this case, we cannot remove the complementizer that and please note that within this complement clause, we already have a subject, a verb, and an adverbial. So it has all the elements that a clause must have. It's complete and there's no gap. Now let's talk about the types of complement clauses we may find surrounding a noun. The main types of noun complement clauses are finite that clauses, non-finite to infinitive clauses, ING clauses beginning with the preposition of and dependent WH interrogative clauses. In the first example, we can see how the that complement clause gives us the content of our head noun, which is claim. In the second example, our head noun is the word decision and what follows in the two infinitive clause gives us the content of the head noun, which is decision. In the following example, our non-finite ing clause is preceded by the preposition of. And please note that in this case, our head noun has a negative connotation. It's no intention. In this case, so, the ing clause gives us information related to the lack of intention this person had of singing at his anniversary. In this last example, the WH clause also gives us information related to the content of the head noun. To finish this part related to noun complement clauses, I want you to have a short list of head nouns which can be used with complement clauses. As we said before, there are fewer nouns which can be used with complements. In respect of that complement clauses, the most common head nouns are the following. In the case of two infinitive clauses, the most common head nouns which are followed by two infinitive clauses are those which are related to goals, opportunities or actions. These are the most common head nouns which can be followed by two infinitive clauses. And regarding ing clauses preceded by the preposition of, these are the most common head nouns which can be followed by this construction. Okay, students, that's all for the elements placed after the head noun. If you have any further doubt, please contact me. See you soon.